Jean-Robert Belland recently came within inches of snagging his first World Series of Poker bracelet when he finished as runner-up in the $1,500 Limit Hold'em Shootout event this year, the final open event before the main event. That deep run has got to have made Bodog happy, as Belland recently inked a deal to represent the poker site on the felt. We have the Team Bodog player in the studio today to talk about his deep run and to give some Limit Hold'em strategies. All right, well, thank you very much for being with us, Jean Robert. Oh, my pleasure. And so, first off, the obvious point is that you did really well in a Limit Hold'em tournament, but Limit Hold'em isn't necessarily known as your forte. I mean, you don't have, this is your first Limit Hold'em cash period. What made you play in this event in the first place? Limit Hold'em is not only not my forte, I'm considered kind of a live one in Limit Hold'em. <laughs> um, Are we talking about cash games or tournaments? Are you Just cash game, tournaments, I mean, Limit Hold'em is not my game. I, um, you know, I'm used to playing a lot of hands, and anyone who plays a lot of hands, it's not going to fare too well in uh, Limit Hold'em unless you just catch a sick rush, but in the long run, you can't win playing a lot of hands Limit Hold'em. Um, I uh, happen to uh, live with uh, Joe Cassidy. I live at his, he has a really nice house in uh, Southern Highlands here, and uh, I've just sat behind him and watched him play online Limit Hold'em. So many hands. I mean, I've gotten to watch basically the best in the world do his thing, and even though I could never come close to the level of play that he's playing, I've gotten a good feel for the game, and uh, that's happened in this last year. Or so, um, I even though I don't consider myself a great limit hold'em player, I feel like I understand what the great players are doing, and I was up against a lot of great players actually, Absolutely. and uh, you know I know what they're up to and. I know how, how they're playing, so I think uh, I actually had an edge in that tournament. Okay. Well, and you said you kind of learned a lot based on looking over the shoulder of Joe. And so, I mean, he was playing Limit Hold'em cash games. What, there, there is a, obviously a big discrepancy between cash games and tournaments. How did you have to, you, what kind of different strategies did you have to use going into a tournament? Well, even though there's differences between tournament and cash games, limit hold'em is still limit hold'em. You have two cards and you're seeing a flop and there's only so much you can do to protect your hand and, and try and get the most value for each hand. And, uh, um, you know, in that respect, it's not that different. I mean, the better limit hold'em players are going to do well in tournament limit, limit uh, uh, hold'em tournaments. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think I actually had a really nice edge on the field. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see me doing well in this event. In addition to that, this was not just a Limit Hold'em event, it was a Limit Hold'em shootout event. And um, um, now is when the tournament comes into play. You know, you're going to play fairly tight with a full game and then um, loosen up as it goes from nine-handed or ten-handed down to uh, two-handed. And uh, making that adjustment is something I'm really good at. Um, and I have that kind of image where everybody thinks I'm playing a lot of hands, so uh, even when we're full, even if I happen to be kind of playing kind of snug, nobody notices that I'm playing well. And it's interesting because after each table, I had a couple of really good players come up to me and say, man, you played really, really well. <laughs> and they were surprised because they had heard what a donkey I was in uh, <laughs> Limit Hold'em. And they're like, man, I, I, I was really surprised at how well you played. And, uh, you know, that's complimentary, sure. But uh, I, I, I could go with uh, still having that image of being a... Limit Hold'em Donkey. I'd like to have that image for a long time. Well, and you kind of briefly talked about your strategy going into each table. Um, you played three tables, correct? Is three what tables. You, you, you talked about your strategy going into each table. Uh, was there a more expansive strategy? Like, did you have a set game plan at the start of each table that you kind of wanted to implement in the early stages? Well, the first thing that I'm doing, I'm not thinking about two tables down the road. I'm just thinking, I need to win this table. And my strategy was definitely to play tight, by-the-book poker, you know, early position raise, uh, you know, easy lay down for ace-jack, those types of things, things that I wouldn't normally do, that I'd be inclined to go ahead and play. Um, so I was playing very, very snug in my first table, and then uh, when it got down to three-handed and two-handed, I was actually up against very tough players, and uh, the edge that I had was that they didn't know how well I was able to play the game, because they had all heard that I couldn't play for anything. So. Um, you know, I was able to make some really good calls, you know, when they, when they were snowing. And, uh, you know, I built up my stack. And uh, the second table was, was particularly tough. 
you know. And now when you get to the second table, basically you're playing the winners of all the first right. tables. And uh, had some really, really tough cats at that table. Um, and was really happy to get past that one. Well, and another, you were talking about how there's not much of a difference between, I mean, there are differences between tournaments and cash games, but one of the most pronounced differences, of course, is the fact that the blinds keep going up and up. So, in your opinion, how much does No Limit Hold'em and Limit Hold'em differ with regards to a short stack, as far as what constitutes a short stack and how to play a short stack effectively in a Limit Hold'em tournament versus No Limit? Well, in No Limit tournament, um, you can make a move, you know, when you have like about seven or eight times the big blind, you can just make a move and just shove your stack and you can do that with a hand like seven, eight suited, eight, nine suited, um, or uh, you know, maybe a couple of deuces or something like that. In, in limit hold'em, um, you're probably gonna get called. So this is, this is the hand that you might go down with. So if you're really short stacked, you know, you wanna put it in your hand with a hand like ace, 10, ace, jack, or a middle pair. You can't really gamble and just hope that everybody uh, just folds. So uh, for sure, you're playing a hand that there's probably going to be a showdown, so this is the hand you want to go in with. Do you really want to put your last chips in with a 7-8 suited? You know, I don't think so. Well, also, it kind of comes down to the fact that maybe you look at a hand and you feel pre-flop that you want to go with it, and then so you bet big and then the flop comes down and you completely miss, say. Mm -hmm. But you have pot odds to continue. But then again, your tournament life is on the line. So do you still continue just because you have pot odds, or does it change because you couldn't get yourself all in pre-flop, and now you see the flop and you have more information? Well, that's the thing, is that in limit hold'em, you can't really protect yourself. You know, a small bet you know, on, 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 on third street is not going to take the pot down. Most people are going to take one up. So there's no sense putting your chips in. In no limit, it's different because you can make a continuation bet, and there's a very good chance you know, that you're going to take the pot down right there. So. In that respect, limit, limit hold'em is very different from no limit. Um, the unique part of this tournament, the one part that I like so much, wasn't the fact that it was a limit hold'em and I was able to surprise him with my limit skills. <laughs> it was more the shootout. I really, really like the shootout format because I consider myself a better shorthanded player than a ring game player. I, I'm one of those people, I'm an action person. I find myself always wanting to play a hand. You know, I look at a hand like uh, nine, ten of spades, and it's just like in me to just want to play that. And in no limit, that uh, may be slightly incorrect, but not nearly as incorrect as it is in a limit hold'em, depending on where the raises are coming in and who's playing the hand. Um, so short-handed, those hands play a lot better. And uh, uh, if I can get past the full, table, the nine-handed, ten-handed situation, and get it down to where it's six-handed, five-handed, four-handed. I think as the table gets shorter and shorter, my edge gets greater and greater. Because you can start playing the style that you're a lot more comfortable with, Exactly, basically. exactly. So, I mean, I love shootouts, and I, I think I should never, ever miss a shootout tournament. Um, the uh, No Limit Shootout actually is my favorite format, um, and uh, there was one tournament that I really regret not playing. Um, at the time, my bankroll was very, very short, and that's the six-handed uh, 5K tournament. Um, six-handed is a game that I really enjoy, too. But, you know, those lineups are super tough. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, now let's go ahead and jump to the actual final table. You've already made it through two, okay. two shootout final tables, mm -hmm. and you're at the final table. What are some of the key hands that you played that kind of got you to the heads up? Well, um, I took control of that table very early. Um, you know, I have my little table talk and my intimidation and you know I've been at several final tables before so my comfort level was probably greater than most of the people at that table um, and um, it took me about an hour, hour and a half to assess who the real players were at the table because there were a few people that I already knew you know Brandon Wong was over there and I knew I didn't want to be messing with him too much and uh, wow there was another tough, tough player that I'm thinking of in particular. Um, wow, what was his name? I feel like it was another Brandon, maybe. Anyways, um, um, yeah, the, uh, super tough, super tough player. And uh, there were a couple players that were a little bit loose, looked like they were like internet, just like push, 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 and I knew that, that they were gonna probably hang themselves, and that did happen. <laughs> um, so basically, again, I wanted to kind of play by the rules, play exactly by the book, limit hold'em, you know, just 
playing position well, and um, uh, then to ch try and take over when I got a little shorter stack. I mean, when it got shorter handed. Um, uh, I had one hand in particular where Brandon Wong raised in early position, and I had ace jack suited, and I couldn't decide whether to play the hand. I was I wasn't sure if I should let, uh, call his raise, uh, raise with it, or fold. And you know, a limit hold'em expert knows exactly what to do with that hand. You know, with ace jack suited, and you're facing a solid player's under the gun raise. You know, pretty much. I think the proper answer to that is to either fold or repop. You know, um, you're probably behind with the repop, but you, at least you're getting heads up, and you know maybe you can hope for a 50-50 situation. But uh, um, I laid it down, and I remember just going to the back and talking to a limit hold'em expert, and I'm like, "What would you do with that hand?" And he says, "Well, you know, I'm either going to fold or I'm going to repop him, but uh, you know, definitely not just going to call." And I thought about that. And interestingly enough, two rounds later, Brandon raises under the gun again, and now I'm looking at ace-10 suited. Well, if the last situation was borderline, <laughs> this situation is probably an insta-fold. Well, I decided, you know what, I'm running kind of good, so I three-bet him with the ace-10 ace ten of hearts. Of course. Um, <laughs> I'm way out of line with that hand, way out of line, and I know it. And um, somehow, you know, we both hit the, uh, the ace, and I hit the 10, and um, I won a really big pot. I'm sure he had ace-king in that hand. But that was a very key pot where basically I was out of line and got lucky on him. One of the things that I do do well is if I happen to get there, um, I know how to punish my opponent because I can put him on ace-king and try and get him for the max. So, yeah, that, that was a key, key hand. Okay. Well, and what happened in heads up? Heads up... I went into heads up um, with an enormous chip lead. I believe I had 2.7 million and my opponent had 300,000. Um, just before we started heads up play, um, he was so short stacked that I pulled him aside to try and make a deal. And he says, well, I don't think there's very much of a deal we can do. You know, he basically had no chips. And I said to him, I said, well, you know, we can do something, you know. First place paid approximately 277,000 and second place paid about 263,000. So I pulled him aside and I said, listen, why don't I guarantee you 17,000 on top of second place, okay? That way instead of walking with 263, you're basically getting an extra 17. I mean, he was basically one hand away from being busted, maybe two hands. And, um, and we talked about it for a little bit and he agreed to the deal and um, when we came back, I was like in celebration mode because I had just won my first bracelet. Um, the, uh, deal, the floor person says, well, you guys got to play out at least one hand. And so I was like just ready to play out the hand, and I'm like just in celebration mode. Well, as it turns out, he won the hand, and he, when he saw that I thought we were done, he was saying, well, we still have to play out for the bracelet. And I said, well, we just made a deal. And he says, well, I didn't understand it as a bracelet deal also. I mean, of course we're going to play out for the bracelet. I don't want to just give away the bracelet. And he had a valid point there. You know, we should play for the bracelet. I mean, we made a money deal. And so I was like, well, I thought we were playing for, I thought we made the deal for the bracelet. And somehow in our discussion, we decided that we didn't really understand the deal. So all of a sudden we had a falling out on the deal. And, you know, so now I'm just focused on trying to win this thing. You know, I just want to just win it outright. And... Um, a little bit later, we got to even in chips. So now I'm like, well, do we want to do a money deal? Because it's just too much of a difference, 277, 263. And he says, sure. So at the time we were about even chips, we decided to, to, to chop the deal. And as far as the World Series of Poker is concerned, they don't uh, uh, honor any chops or anything. That's between the players. So he and I agreed to chop the money. And uh, he actually had a few more chips than I did, so I gave him 2000 from my share. And he and I agreed on that. So now we continue to play, and I start thinking to myself, well, why am I chopping it right now? We had already made a deal before where I gave him 17000 on top of second place money. And uh, what did I just do here? I'm making a deal now. Okay, so the bracelet wasn't included in our last agreement, so we played for the bracelet, but why all of a sudden is he getting another $35,000 out of this? And one of the things I pride myself in is being a 
pretty good negotiator. I'm reasonable, and you know, we work things out. I'd already negotiated a pretty good deal for myself in case I happened to go bad and the guy got even or ends up winning. Um, uh, what happened here? And so now I'm just thinking to myself, wow, how did I screw that up? Why didn't I just keep the deal the way it was? And, you know, and it's not like I said, okay, no deal, or he said no deal, but there was just kind of like all of a sudden we had an agreement and all of a sudden there was no agreement because of the misunderstanding with the bracelet. So now we're even in chips, and that's just on my mind, and I can't shake it. How could you be so dumb, Jean Robert? And then I'm thinking to myself, man, uh, where are my like poker player friends to like say, hey, Robert, what are you doing here? Yeah. You can't do that. You, you play for the bracelet. So what? You still got a great money deal. Done. You know. And uh, at the time, I was like, how did this happen? How did this happen? And I couldn't shake that. And in the meantime, he is running pretty good. And I think that actually, until he got to even in chips, I played fairly well. When he got even with me, I think at that point, you know, I was like in panic mode and uh, <laughs> made a few mistakes that I, that I re regret. You know, I paid off a little bit too much. And He's weighing a little too heavily on your mind, basically. Yeah, and he was, he was a very, very good limit holding player, but still, even the best in the world to overcome an 8 to 1 or 9 to 1 chip lead is, is incredible. Right. And, uh, you know, missing out on that bracelet, even though we chopped the money, missing out on the bracelet was just devastating. You know, the extra 30000 that I was all worried about, is that kind of money, when you, winning 200000 or winning 170000 isn't like a huge deal. Missing a bracelet was monstrous. And, I mean, I was absolutely devastated, as you can imagine. Well, in, in what ways would things have changed if you had won? Well, I mean... For, for one thing, you know, my, uh, my sponsor, Bodog, I just signed with them like uh, six months ago. And we haven't done like a huge long-term deal yet. Um, you know, I'm sure they would be just ecstatic to have a, a bracelet winner on their team in addition to Dave Williams. And um, uh, that, that would be incredible. I just think it, it, it also would solidify my position in the poker community as like a solid, solid player. I think I'm still that guy who's like nightclub owner that plays some <laughs> cards that uh, is kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm a card pro, but I think in the poker community, I'm still not respected as like one of the, uh, one of the serious pros. And uh, that just really kind of trumps that. Yeah, bracelet just says, hey, you know what, this, guy, this guy's for real. And uh, that recognition uh, would mean a lot to me. Um, and uh, I think that with sponsorship deals and that all, all kinds of things. I mean, I, if I got a bracelet, for sure, maybe Card Player Magazine or the other the, the other magazines in, in, in our industry would all want to have me on the cover and things like that. It's just it would be a very very big thing for me. And I'm somebody that um, I'm somebody who whose exposure is bigger than just in the poker world because of my background in Survivor and in Hollywood and everything. I mean, uh, a lot more people are interested in how I perform than just the poker community. And a bracelet, you know, could have meant me doing like maybe commercials or what, I, I, I don't know. But it would have been really, really big for me. And it will be big for me because um, I feel like that experience that I got right there is just going to help me get my bracelet a lot easier next year. I'll get a bracelet next year. Just got the ball rolling, basically. I got, I'll get You've a bracelet You've already got a next taste. Year. I'll get a bracelet <laughs> next year. And, and um, in the main event, you know, I did pretty well in the mm -hmm. main event. Um, uh, I was at a table with Howard Lederer. And interestingly enough, somehow Howard and I, with all the tournaments we've played, he and I have only been at the same table. This is the second time. And I asked him, I said, Howard, you know, I squandered a 9-to-1 chip lead. Um, has that ever happened to you? He says, you know what, John Rivera, it's happened to me. It's happened to me a couple times. He's like, I had a 30-to-1 chip lead that I managed to lose. And it's like, here I am talking to one of the best players of all time, and he's telling me that that's happened to him as well. So it's like, you know what, hey, it, it is brutal, and I can't tell you how many of my friends are like, Robert, how could you mess that up? <laughs> <laughs> I was... I was at um, a, a Bodog party with uh, with the grinder, 
And uh, in order to get in, they gave you these like little uh, wristbands to get in there. And he's, uh, Grinder comes up to me and says, Rivera, I see you finally got your bracelet. <laughs> 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 I'm like great. That was the night. That was the <laughs> night after I missed it. Too soon. Too soon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talked about how you had just recently signed with Bodog. Um, obviously, that's got to be pretty exciting for you. Mm. Are you at liberty to kind of discuss some of the the finer aspects of that deal, like what you do for them, what they can do for you, stuff like that? Well, um, basically, they have given me a deal where um, they give me so much money to play, especially televised events. And um, my deal with them is actually heavy on media bonuses. So when I do, uh, like, you know, uh, like I had gotten a feature table for the main event, things like that, or if uh, ESPN is talking about maybe doing a feature on um, me surviving the World Series versus surviving Survivor, and that type of thing goes really well with, with my sponsor. So, um, I think that they're very, very pleased with uh, the exposure that they've gotten with me, and I see us having a long-term relationship. And also on a related note, so you aren't sick of all the survivor puns yet? Um, <laughs> when you do a show like Survivor, um, I'll be honest with you, when they asked me to do Survivor, I said, didn't want to do it, you know. I. I just had no interest, and some friends of mine were like, hey, you know what, this could be kind of kind of fun, you know, plus it's a 1 in 16 chance of making a million dollars, you know, and that kind of EV is like better than any tournament, plus I'm not paying anything paying to get in. Um, I knew that it could be good for my career overall, you know, even if I wanted to get back in the nightclub industry and open up a club, well, you know, hey, such and such from Survivor would be maybe easy to round up investors. Um, uh, I knew it would be a good thing for me for life, and I hated being on Survivor. <laughs> People were like, hey, was it fun? No, it's not fun. Does it look fun? Is it fun <laughs> not to eat for four days, to be kept up all night with smelly girls and guys all crowded up next to you because they got to keep warm and you're just nasty, and you know, you, you go out and you have to, you know, take your dump in the woods and, and you know, run down the lake to wash off. You know, there's no toilet paper, no toothbrushes. It's just nasty. So you're not a camper. Uh, <laughs> My idea of camping is, you know, you know, having a tent with like a big old fluffy sleeping bag and cuddling up with a hot girl. You know, come on, that's that, that's camping. You know, let's have a fire, get some marshmallows. You know, hey, who's got the uh, chocolate sauce? That's that's my idea of camping. This was this was brutal, um, but it was a life experience, and I don't regret doing it. It was tough, tough, tough. But one thing I did enjoy. So it's fun to watch that on TV. Yeah. That was sure. really fun. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming in, and thank you very much. And congratulations again. I know that's kind of bittersweet to say congratulations, but still, it, congratulations definitely aren't in order. So. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. And next time, maybe we'll, we'll have a bracelet to talk yeah, about. Yeah, next time you'll be wearing some bracelets. <laughs> bracelets. <laughs> right. <laughs> and thank you guys for watching the Online Zone on Card Player TV.